What is up everybody? Thank you so much for tuning in today. I have a very, very big pickup for you. Um, I do a lot of mail day videos on this channel, uh, maybe less recently than um, in, in past times, but I just made one of the biggest pickups um, of my life. Uh, and it's actually one of the coolest cards in my, maybe the coolest card in my collection currently, depending on how you view things. Um, so stay tuned to check that out. But I feel like this video is especially fitting right now. Um, it seems like the, the flavor of the month conversation um, after Dan got or Dan catch them all collectibles recent live stream on Thursday it seems like the talk of the town is going to be uh, flippers versus collectors for a while and man I have a nice healthy rant about that kind of topic in general so maybe I'll maybe I'll be able to like hop on in a live with somebody pretty soon and kind of like chop it up about that topic and just my general sentiments on this sort of thing but as you know I both buy and sell cards, I flip cards, I link my eBay store in the description of all of my videos, but I'm also a collector. Um, sometimes I have a bigger focus on one or the other, and with this purchase, um, this is a this hits me right in the collector feels, okay? So, I made a trade with, a, with another individual for a, um, I'll just go ahead and show the back, it's, a, it's an old back Japanese card, okay? Um, this was a, a trade plus cash, so partial trade, um, I'm not going to disclose like the exact value or whatever the card. I mean, it's a pretty commonly bought and sold card, so there is price data out there. But it's a card that I've been watching the price trajectory of for quite a while, and I, you know, probably like six or seven months or so. Um, and over the last two months, I've actually seen like a slight uptick in sales velocity and pricing. Um, so I'm glad that I was able to snag a copy when I did because I think that I would have been priced out of it um, within reason, obviously. Um, but it was very helpful to be able to do a trade plus cash for this card um, just because like, you know, I work in the public sector and, um, you know, if you know anything about that, then like people who work in the public sector generally tend not to make like insanely high salaries or whatever. Um, and that is the case with me. So most of my collecting is funded through my business, like through my buying and selling. So keep that in mind. Now, the individual I, individual I traded with is another um, pretty active member of the hobby. You've probably seen his handle in, like, you know, uh, PK videos and stuff like that. Recently, Dan um, Catch em All Collectibles, he was there, too, recently. Um, but I'm not going to disclose too much into that, but this guy is awesome. He was super easy to work with, and that actually made trades so much better. Um, also, shout out to Professor Oak for middlemanning this deal for us. You should all go subscribe to his channel. Um, he's the best. Now, one of the uh, one of the things that came along with like this trade, in addition to like making a new acquaintance in the hobby, um, the individual also sent me this card, which is an extremely off-centered old back Japanese, and this is a Neo Discovery Scyther. Really, really awesome. As you guys know, hopefully, um, Scyther is by far my favorite Pokemon. Um, I'm a, I consider myself to be a pretty decently sized Scyther collector. I'm going for a Scyther Master Set. Um, and this card is just amazing. This this is perfect. So this super OC old back Japanese card. I mean, it just looks great. Um, I might see if I can get the OC qualifier from PSA on this one. But yeah, very awesome freebie that was thrown in for this trade. Thank you very much for that. Now, I'll talk to you about the types of items that I traded to the individual. Um, but first, I'm going to show you the card. Okay. So the back of this card is fresh. Like... Keep this in mind when you see the grade in a second, okay? Please. No whitening. No whitening. Okay, now if you know CGC, then you probably will be able to have a conversation about this, but no whitening at all on this card. I picked up a Grand Party. This is a, a very rare Japanese prize card. Um... Essentially, from the years 1999 to the year 2000, there were three like seasonal like tournaments, so to speak, uh, or tournament time time frames um, that you could participate in. Um, so we had the 1999 Summer Battle Road, the 1999 Winter Battle Road, and then we also had the 2000 Spring Battle Road. So during those three competitions, um, players had these little passport books, and if you recorded the details of 50 matches against 50 opponents. Um, and you submitted the little passport book back into, you know, an eligible recipient, 
um, you would receive this grand party as a prize for your efforts. Okay. In addition to receiving the grand party, you also um, were entered into a lottery in order to be like basically expedited into large prestigious tournaments, including the Tropical Mega Battle, which is one of the most historic tournaments in Pokemon history, the most monumental tournaments in Pokemon history. Um, so the Grand Party just is like, there's a quote that I pulled out recently um, from a Mount Moon forum, and I wish I could just put it on screen for you, um, but it's from Charlie Herlocker himself, okay, on the Mount Moon forum, and he said, Grand Party is the ultimate combination of every category we have ever tried to apply to early Japanese promos. Okay, so the age-old debate is like, is the Grand Party a trophy card? I'm going to go out on a limb and say, like, personally, no, I don't believe that the Grand Party is a trophy card, simply due to the fact that it was not given out, like, technically speaking, it was not given out as, like, a, a prize, you know, um, what am I trying to say here, um, Price support. It was not given out as price support. Okay, now it was more than just a participation card, though, because you can't just you can't just play during like the the summer battle road or the autumn battle road, winter battle road, and um, spring battle road. I think I said summer battle road earlier for 1999. It was the autumn battle road. Please, please keep that in mind. Forgive me in the comments down below. But yeah, so you couldn't just participate in them. You had to you had to catalog the details of at least fifty battles, which is quite a lot. I mean, you had to be committed to some degree. Um, so this card is like dramatically rarer than any set card ever created. Okay, this is completely rarer than any gold star. Okay, gold star Rayquaza, gold star Charizard, way rarer than those. This is rarer than any alt art. Okay. Um, it's not, it's not known exactly how many copies of this card were released or manufactured. Um, there was a time during like a, a mistranslation of this text or the text that came with the envelope to, with which this card was awarded, essentially leading people to believe that there were somewhere around like, you know, a hundred or a thousand copies. Right now, PSA has graded like 760 of them, give or take throughout all the grades. I know BGS has graded some, CGC has graded some, clearly. So I would say that the graded population of this card is about 1,000 right now, and there are still raw copies available, so there are more than 1,000 of these cards. I would put, personally, my projection would probably be somewhere in between like 1,500 and 2,500 would be the absolute cap, in my opinion, for a card like this, um, just given the time frame and the barrier to entry. Obviously, this card was not printed for a worldwide consumer base. This card was printed for people in Japan in the year 1999 who are participating in the Pokemon trading card game. Okay, this was not a worldwide global distribution. This was an extremely niche release. And so my point in saying all of this is I don't consider this a trophy card, but if we look at like the the hierarchy of promos, we have like, you know, trophy cards are at the top. Below that I would put prize cards. Below that, we have participation promos and then just your general run-of-the-mill promotional cards, okay? So an example of a, a participation promo, a participa participation promo would be like the Masaki cards, okay? So the Masaki cards are projected to have had a print run of about 30,000 each, which is dramatically more than the Grand Party. So the Grand Party is technically, it is by definition rarer than the Masaki promos. Um, the Masaki promos are obviously much scarcer in 10, PSA 10 grade, um, because of like the Masaki mark, the typical indentation that's found on Masaki cards. Um, so the Grand Party is like, by definition, um, orders of magnitude rarer than any Masaki card. Um, so Masaki cards are still really awesome though. So we have like just your general run of the mill promo card. We have participation cards. Then we have prize cards, which is where I would put this in. But at the end of the day, it's like a it's a rare Japanese promo, a vintage Japanese promo. Um, but yeah, I consider this to be a prize card. It was given out as a as a prize for you putting in the sweat equity to participating in so many battles during this time frame. Okay. Now above that, we do have trophy cards, which thinking to like the 1997 Pika trophies, the Trophy Kangaskhan. Okay, really really top tier cards that are bringing in boatloads of boatloads of uh, value but then we also have cards like the victory medals the pikachu victory medals there are tens of thousands of those cards released but they're technically considered a trophy card because you were given them for placing within like a you know an event a pokemon organized play event 
Thinking back too on my channel, I featured recently a, uh, a Scyther card that I got back from PSA. It's a first place Pokemon League Scyther. That's technically a trophy card. It was given out to you for being number one in your Pokemon League. Um, but that card obviously is also much less rare than the Grand Party. So how the nomenclature or vernacular by which we use to categorize these cards is kind of all over the place, and that's why Charlie Herlocker's comment in the Mount Moon thread really stuck out to me a lot. Like, Grand Party is kind of a little bit of everything. It's this hodgepodge of labels, right? But for me, it's a very, very awesome, historic, vintage Japanese promo. This is like the top tier. It's amongst the top tier of rare Japanese promo cards, and that is why it's so special, and that's why I hold it in such a high regard in my collection as well. Um, checking out this part of the card so we do see if my camera will focus the double black star rarity that was reserved for very high-end cards um, from this time frame such as you have your trophy Kangaskhan and your 1997 Pikas I believe the illustrator has the double black star rarity as well and those are some of the only cards that this was this rarity tier was shared by and that kind of speaks to the the rarity of the card and when I say that there's like 1500 copies of it out there projected like okay i'll show you, you know, i obviously I, I collect world's cards so i'll show you my personal favorite this is my this is my thumbnail photo on ebay and discord or uh youtube and discord this is the Ch staff champions festival from 2015 okay this was before the pokemon go boom not a ton of people participating there's probably a thousand copies of this card that exist in the world okay that's this is a card that a lot of people like they go their collecting journey without ever seeing this card because they just buy modern off of the shelves okay so the grand party has a similar distribution as something like the staff champions festival um and it's just interesting because they both have like unique stories behind like how you would go and acquire them and then looking at another card like for example the 2020 player ceremony this is another prize card you had to cash in 15 points from the um from participating in the Pokemon organized play during the year 2020. This card was similar in the fact that it's a prize card, but this card is far less rare than the Grand Party. And this card is probably rarer than every set card in the in the plant on the planet at this time, right? Like this card is likely rarer than your gold stars, your alternate arts and stuff like that. And there were tens of thousands of this card produced easily, more than the Masaki cards for sure. Grand Party is a, an insanely rare card. I mean, we talk about 1,500 copies of the card and, you know, the law of large numbers. Like, people people have a, a hard time grasping the concept of big numbers the bigger they get. But 1,500 seems like a lot. But you look at, like, something like the Shadowless Charizard or first edition base at Charizard. Like, there are maybe hundreds of thousands of that card that were printed, right? That was a mass-produced product. Grand Party was not. This is a very rare exclusive card. Not everybody who collects Pokemon can physically own a copy of this card, and that that's just something really special. So these are the types of cards that I'm really hunting for right now, and you know, like I said, I've been monitoring the market on Grand Party for probably six to seven months, and it's been it's been doing some interesting things, so I'm glad that I've slotted a copy for myself into my collection. And taking a really close look at the hollow pattern, which for the record, I will be uploading a YouTube short probably on Tuesday that gives like a really good look at the hollow pattern. There's also no scratches on the hollow, right? So we saw in the back zero whitening, and we see on the front no hollow scratches. So you're probably thinking, what is up with this card? Now, if you know CGC, then you know that they they value like dents differently than, um, than would PSA. You can see in this corner, there's a bit of a lip. Now this lip reminds me of the lip that is usually evident on like alpha cards in Magic the Gathering. If 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 I'm speaking correctly, it's either alpha or beta. Usually has like upturned upturn upturned corners, and that's like a big indicator on like whether it is distinctly alpha or beta. So that's what this corner reminds me of, and it's also visible on this one as well. If I can catch it in the right light. Now I don't know that it's that important that I even identify it on this corner. Yeah, you can see it a little bit there, not super well. Okay, but these corners just have small little like upturns on them, small corner bends. They're not creased. So I think that honestly what I could do is crack this out of the slab. I could put it in a card saver and I could just use the end of a screwdriver 
the rounded end, okay, something along those lines to literally just roll this flatter. And I think that that in itself would bring this 7.5 to anywhere, you know, <laughs> anywhere including a 9 or an 8.5 at, or at CGC. And that's just, it doesn't mean that they're less strict on bends or creases or anything like that. It just means that they value them differently. It's like a different grading scale they're using, right? Just like when you were in school. Okay, it's a different grading scale. It's weighted differently. But yeah, I, honestly, I think that, that I align with that kind of grading system. Um, much better than PSA because PSA would probably give this card a four because it's one corner, two corners. The fact that a bend exists would historically dock it to a six. And then the fact that you have two of them, you might be in like five or four or five territory. And this is obviously not a PSA four. Like this is not a four or a five condition card. This is not a bad condition card whatsoever. There's zero lightning and it has a clean hollow. That means that this card was stored in a relatively secure way. Obviously, those corners I wish were a little bit better taken care of, but it's just an immaculate, immaculate copy. And I really do feel like I got a, a good deal on this. Shout out to my friend Gump Brave from the Squeaks Discord. Um, I had to cave and show him this card early just because I'm so excited about it. Um, and he kind of like, he commented like, I'm sure you got a great specimen for a fair deal. And I was like, oh wow, I guess I didn't realize that my pickups were so monotonous and you know, he, he, he kind of, like, uh, reassured me that, like, it's not that they're monotonous, it just means that I'm, like, a thoughtful pursuer of cards, and that, that was a, you know, I felt like that pretty, pretty much sums it up. I do try to be thoughtful and intentional about the cards I buy. I've been looking for a copy of this card for, like, seven months and haven't pulled the trigger till now, partially because that cash plus trade was such a sweet, sweet deal. I didn't want to shell over the full amount of cash value, um, but yeah, just an amazing card, and this makes me happy to be a collector. This card for me just checks all the boxes. It is it is an amazing piece of history that I'm so glad to finally have locked away in my collection. This is a copy of this card that, you know, who knows if it's ever going to pass hands again um, while I'm still alive. So just a really great card. Will this be the, the highest level of grail that I ever own? No, I, I have lofty goals. I plan to pursue, I plan to pursue some pretty, pretty substantial cards um, in the future, but this is a card that I will always remember and cherish quite, quite dearly because this is a big leap for me. So very glad to slot this into my, into my collection. And with that being said, it is okay to be a collector. Um, but yeah, so I hope that you guys have enjoyed this kind of deep dive into a card like this. It's a big one for me. Hopefully I've been able to convey that well, um, through like my tone and the words that I'm choosing to use and describe this card and, I don't know. So I appreciate all of you for watching videos like this. Thank you for your continued support, and I really hope to see you on the next one.